This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to another segment of Silent Voices. I'm your host Carol Kramer and I'm very happy to be here for a very special reason. During my lifetime I have been a classroom teacher, a school social worker, a clinical social worker and I'm a marriage and family counselor. My primary interest in all of those fields have been children and the family. And when I talk about the family, I'm not only talking about individuals, but I'm talking about the extended family. I'm talking about cousins, aunts, uncles, and in particular, I am talking about grandparents too. The reason I talk about grandparents is because research has shown us that grandparents especially can serve as magnificent parents to their grandchildren. Today I have grandparents in our studio and as our guest they are Mr. and Mrs. Garcia. Margaret and Jose, and they're from Sand Lake, Michigan. Margaret is a concerned grandparent who has been trying to gain the adoption of her grandchild. This grandparent's ordeal started in 2003 when their grandson was taken by CPS, Children Protective Services, for those of you that don't know what CPS is, and was put into the foster care system. The acting agency on this case was Bethany Christian Services of Grand Rapids. Many of you are from Michigan and know where Bethany Christian Services is located in Grand Rapids. Here at Michigan for Parental Rights, we have looked over all of their documents. And many of us have noticed the fact that we felt it was important to tell you, the viewer, that there are some, or in some cases, all out discrepancy told by the agency in this case. Eventually, many of these discrepancies led up to the denial for adoption of their grandson. So what I want to do is I want to Welcome Margaret and Jose to the show today. And I guess I would like them to start by showing you photographs of the children about whom we are speaking and they will be telling you in detail. Go ahead uh, Margaret, I'll give you a chance to show the photos. This is a photograph of our son's child Joshua Garcia. He is their biological child. And this is a photograph of Alyssa. They were one week away from final adoption of Alyssa. Alyssa is a niece to our daughter-in-law. 
So she's a family member on our daughter-in-law's side that they were one week away from final adoption. What you're saying is actually they're cousins. It's the cousin. Yes, these children are okay. cousins. Would you tell uh, the audience how old they are? Um, at the time, Alyssa was six years old and Joshua was three years old. Okay, thank you. Um, how did this whole case get started? What um, was happening, Margaret? The case got started um, when my grandson, excuse me, the case got started when my son was giving our grandson Joshua a bath. And Joshua urinated in the tub when he was done. And so my son took him out of the tub and ran a little hot water in the tub and he was going to come back and sanitize the tub before preparing Alyssa's bath. So he had taken Joshua out of the bathroom and was getting him dressed in his pajamas. And um, Alyssa mistakenly went into the bathroom and got into the tub that had a little bit of hot water. So she was burned mostly like on the back of her legs. And they took her out and they gave her a cool shower and her legs were red, but there were no blisters or anything. And so she was no longer in pain, and they put her to bed, and she was fine all night long. And then in the morning, they saw that the back of her pajama pants were wet, so they looked to see why her pants were wet, and they found that she had blisters on the back of her legs. So they took her to the hospital, and they went to a Metropolitan Hospital, and she did have uh, burns here. This is um, the burn estimation sheet, and uh, she had a little, mostly burns like on the back of her legs here, because there was just a little bit of hot water in a tub, but she had no burns on her hands at all, and this is one of the things that was put in the adoption denial report was that the parents had boiled water on the stove and poured boiling water all over her hands. And as you can see here, there are no burns on her hands. Nobody poured any boiling water on her hands. And then um, the hospital also claimed that she had broken bones. And as you can see here, this is uh, the total body bone survey. And it says here that there are no signs of healing skeletal trauma, which means she does not have any broken bones. And then they also said that she had bruises all over her back. And this is one of the doctor reports that shows that there is nothing on her back. She has no bruises, no burns, no injuries on her back at all. And then on another doctor's report, and these reports were hidden from us, um, but we finally got a hold of them. This report by another doctor shows that there are no signs of child abuse and it's written here, the patient has no battle signs. So there is no signs of child abuse. And then over here on the total body bone scan, it also shows that she has no broken bones, no organ injury, she has nothing there. The pediatric bone survey was also ordered and performed it showed negative skeletal survey. A CT of the abdomen and pelvis with trauma protocol was performed. A face and brain CT were negative. CT of the abdomen and pelvis showed no organ injury. She had no other injuries besides the accidental burns to mostly the back of her legs. And then, This is a re another hidden report. All right, this actually is part of our um, adoption denial paper. 
And up here it reads that the victim was a six-year-old adopted daughter, sustained severe burns on her hands suspected to have been caused by having boiling water deliberately poured on them. And as you remember from the first paper, there's absolutely no burns on her hands. Now, who wrote that, Margaret? Um, this was actually written by Bill Johnson, William Johnson, of the Michigan Children's Institute. So this is his report telling us that we can't adopt Joshua. And also in here it says that she had recent uh, fractured hip as well as bruises on her face and back. Now she did have a bruise on her cheek from a fall the day before, but she did not have any injuries on her back as that paper has shown you. So what I've heard you say here so far today is that everything that the hospital checked out seemed just fine. There were no injuries whatsoever except for uh, the fact of uh, that she climbed into the bathtub and sat in the hot water. Yes, there was and a little was bit it. of hot water. Okay, and so there were some uh, blisters the next day, but nothing on her hands, no, no boiling water was poured on them, no, no broken bones, no, no bruises, Nothing, no. and it looks like you have a report of several doctors that they did several tests and several scans. Yes, these are medical reports. Okay, now I have a little bit of confusion here. Um, you talked about adopting the children. Now, how did it happen that you were going to get your grandson and the granddaughter, that you were going to adopt them? I'm not sure. Well. What we were going to try to do is adopt them if my son could not get the children back. But in all the court cases that I have done, um, I have always asked them to return the children to their parents. Mm -hmm. So I did try to adopt them, but my real goal is that I really wanted the children to return back to their parents mm -hmm. because they were falsely accused of child abuse. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when you say the cases that I have done, have you had other cases that you've known about or been a part of or what? Actually, the cases I'm speaking of are court cases that I have done because when they denied us to adopt Joshua, I took the case and my son also took his case to appeals court. My son and I have actually fought a parallel case through the court system trying to get these children back. So in, in my case, I had a Section 45 case to appeal the denial of adoption of our grandson, Joshua. And we took it to the, um, the appeals court, and then we also took it to the Michigan Supreme Court, and I also took it to the U.S. Supreme Court, and no one would help us get the children back. Did you find out, did they give you a basic reason? Was it just because everyone was led to believe that uh, because Mr. Johnson there and Bethany Holm uh, seemed to maintain it was child abuse and everyone believed them? Um, yes. Um, with this case being the child abuse, they said that child abuse runs in the family. So if the parents are child abusers, then other people in the family are child abusers also, which we are not and neither are my son or, and daughter-in-law. So I'm going to assume or presume or ask you if there was ever a history in your family of child abuse. No, never. Okay. So, um, who are the people or the agencies that all got this underway and how did that go? I think a lot of people out there are wondering, how did this get started? We would know that naturally a hospital has to report any kind of suspicious thing happening to a child. So I would imagine that they were the first ones that had to notify someone. Yes. 
Okay, then take it from there. How did it go when it gets a lot of control, it sounds like? Okay, it first started when my son and his wife, Ophelia, they took Alyssa to Metropolitan Hospital ER. And it was Dr. Dawn Clark who actually filed the child abuse papers. Mm -hmm. Yes. And also, um, uh, there was a social worker there named Timothy Bozung, B-O-Z-U-N-G, that was involved in the case also. And then it went to um, uh, the Children's Protective Services, commonly called CPS, and Todd Myers was the social worker on this case. And also involved was a Dr. Vit Vincent Pelusi, who was head of CPS and also a doctor with uh, DeVos Children's Hospital. And then when Alyssa was transferred to Blodgett Hospital to the burn unit, the doctor involved there was Dr. Richard Wilcox. And then other agencies that became involved were the Wyoming Police Department, um, the detective was Michael Strove, and then later a Jason Castor um, came to our house and talked to us. And the agency that has Joshua's case is uh, Bethany Christian Services. And the foster worker there was Julie Camerad. And then later the adoption worker there was Eric Visser. And then Alyssa's case was in a different adoption agency. It was with D.A. Blodgett Services. And the social worker involved there after she was injured was Joy Inglesma. And the state attorney appointed for the children was Michael LaQuigley. And in the Kent County Court, the people involved are Judge Nana Ruth Carpenter prosecutor Laura Clifton, and both Judge Carpenter and Laura Clifton are also former employees of Bethany Christian Services. And also uh, referee Deborah Ottman was involved in this case. So, and there's other people in agencies that later became involved, but they're too numerous to mention at this time. Wow, so you had quite a few people involved. Yes, we do. When I looked at the materials that you were holding up there, what caught my interest was that it seemed so obvious that there was not all kinds of injury. You and your husband have never been reported for raising children with injuries. How many children did you have? We have two children, have a two? son and a daughter. Okay, and they were never reported at no, all? No, never. And uh, yet, for some reason, it's, it appeared to me somebody was ignoring the evidence that seemed obviously um, quite open to read. That I, so what did they say? Did they say something like, um, it's just because she had the blisters and the water wasn't tested? Is that what they no. said? Actually, what they did was they hid all this evidence. Um, they, hid, um, they hid the report of Dr. Um, Allison Ayote, which said that there, were, there was no child abuse and all those tests that they did were negative, that there were no broken bones or organ injuries. That was hid from us. Somebody anonymously gave us that report. There was another hidden report uh, by Dr. Karen uh, Vanderlaan. Um, and in there, her report, when she examined Alyssa at Blodgett, she's the one that put in there that when she examined her back, she found no injuries at all to her back. There were no bruises or any injuries on her back. And then, um, so what they did is they actually hid much of this evidence from us. Did you have an attorney that was there helping you somehow through this? Yes, we had attorneys helping us, but it's very hard to do a case when the state is hiding all this evidence. 
So your, um, your attorney at that point didn't have copies of that evidence when you went to court? No. Wow. And also, I'd like wow. to say that, that Todd Myers of CPS actually didn't listen to the subpoena to turn over all the, the case records and reports. So um, our attorney had to tell the court to make them turn over the records and reports. And so they just ignored the subpoena and did not do this. So when our lawyers went to court on the case, they didn't even have this information that they should have had. Did you have that information at the time? No, I did not. You didn't even know it. I mean, you knew from your own personal history that um, the children were not abused in any way. That's correct. But you didn't have it until later on after this was all somewhat settled. Yes. Isn't that a violation somehow of your rights in court and your constitutional rights? Yes, and I'd also like to say too mm -hmm. is that um, the children's private pediatrician mm -hmm. was Dr. My, uh, Dr. Donald Bouchard mm -hmm. who was also the head of pediatrics at Metropolitan Hospital. The state completely blocked Dr. Bouchard out of our case, would not let him see Alyssa, would not let him, him uh, talk to them or, or look at his records or anything. So the state totally blocked the children's personal pediatrician from this case. Wow. Do you have any other route that you can go at this time? Have you exhausted all the avenues? Um, well, I'm still trying to get the message out to other people, but this all, I'd like to go back about the constitutional rights. This is also a violation of the 5th and the 14th Amendments by denying our family what is called due process of law, which means the court is supposed to be fair, and there has never been anything fair on this case. And also, the court ignored our medical evidence. They ignored expert witness testimony. And I think that um, the court conspired with the prosecution team and the agencies involved to ignore or hide our medical evidence. The agency notes and reports ignored subpoenas and tampered with evidence and withheld the evidence. So as you can see, this is a great violation and actually it's a great abomination of justice that they have done to our entire family. It certainly seems very understandable that you would be frustrated and upset and for every logical reason I understand why. I think it's um, really kind of going to court at a disadvantage when you didn't even know some of those documents were available and that they existed and that they didn't put them out there. Yes. That they weren't, you know, it's like most people say, I like a fight if it's fair, but if it's unfair yeah. and when it was slanted against you, um, I, I'm very sorry that that happened. Perhaps some of our readers out there in uh, television land, our listeners, uh, will be, uh, compelled to send in some kind of um, information, calls, advice, whatever, after viewing this show. So we'd like to, I'd like to thank you both for being on our show, and I'd like to uh, thank our visitors, our viewers, for watching. And I am asking for your comments again, once again, your suggestions, and um, especially, would you be willing to email us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. And you'll see that on your screen. So we're looking forward to hearing from you. And once again, I would like to thank you um, for coming to the show. I'd like to thank our viewers for watching. And once again, um, we appreciate uh, everything that our viewers have contacted us about. Please don't forget about our social network at myparentalrights.ning.com. 
Uh, you can get more information there. In fact, I'd like to invite any of you, if you would like to be on the show, please contact us. And once again, let me thank you, the viewer, for watching this week's edition of Silent Voices. Remember, your voice can make a difference. The children's voices sometimes are silent, but your voices can be heard. Thank you for watching us. I'm Dennis Lawrence, president and founder of Michigan for Parental Rights. I would like to take a few moments to speak with you about a serious matter plaguing our nation. There is an agency called Child Protective Services. This agency has taken children out of families needlessly and placing them in foster care for Title IV E funds out of our Social Security money. Many of these children are being abused in the foster care system that is supposed to protect them. In the past few months, we have received information of a child being taken from a blind couple in Missouri because they are blind. Here in Michigan, grandparents have lost their grandchildren due to their home being too small. We are seeing family preservation programs being cut and the hiring of more CPS workers. Poverty many times has been mistaken for abuse and neglect. In the family court system, children are taken by the preponderance of evidence, meaning that there's about 50% of proof of abuse and neglect existed. The maybes, the might be's, the could have been's. These parents are never brought to criminal court because there is not enough evidence to prove their guilt in criminal court. Here at Michigan for Parental Rights, we believe that the family is the basic cell structure of society. A nation founded on a healthy family environment creates a moral society. We believe ch children have a right to be parented equally by mother and father without interference by the, either the state or the government. When parents cannot parent together, we remind them of their highest obligation to keep their children safe, secure, well cared for, and healthy. We believe grandparents in the next of kin have the God-given rights to parent without government interference. We ask that you join our quest in reforming the child welfare system. We are not asking for money. We're asking for your voice. Help us bring these children home. To learn more, you can visit us at our social network at miparentalrights.ning.com. That's miparentalrights.ning.com. Thank you.